Hey, Mr. Baldwin, you ready for a road trip? Let's do this, Miss Awad. I'm ready to drive. Wouldn't you love to take our students out to an outcrop like this? I don't know about taking the students, but I think it'd be fun just to go. I, I think that they would learn so much going out and actually seeing rocks and, and structures just like this. So students, we are going to be going on a field trip later this month, and you will see some outcrops. It won't be as spectacular as this, but we'll be talking a little bit during this segment about what we're going to see on the field trip. Absolutely. So um, I think it's an important way to get started here to talk about why we need to know about structural geology and what some of the tools are that they're using. It's always a good question to bring up right at the beginning. Why do we care? I mean, so what? Who cares about it? Okay, well, since this is a short video, let's play it right in this video for them. So I'm going to go ahead and queue up the video, okay? Cool. The recent award that we received from Seismic Microtechnology is actually a three-year grant. It provides five licenses to use their very sophisticated state-of-the-art seismic imaging and 3D visualization software. The Kingdom software we've actually had for about the last 12 years, so we've become very familiar with the capabilities of the software. It's very prevalent in the oil and gas industry for examining subsurface geologic structure, for exploring and producing hydrocarbons, examining active subsurface faults, also for looking for other mineral sources including potable water supplies in the subsurface. The ability to use Kingdom Suite is really really great for my research but also for our for future students work because it's a product that's used extensively in industry and so by having integrating it to our research it prepares us for industry work which is very good professionally and then from kind of a research point of view it's very useful because we're interested in how environments change with time and it's very difficult to get your mind wrapped around what's going on in that area without some kind of 3D visualization tool. We would basically be limited to sort of two-dimensional images and without that proper perspective your understanding and appreciation of what the hazard and their capabilities are are much more limited. Really cool. I love that they can see in three dimensions on the computer of what's underground. Lots of useful information about what geologists are doing right now with those kinds of tools. So let's talk about what we're going to be learning in this segment. So by the end of this video, you should be able to define the word deformation. You should be able to describe the relationship between force, stress, and strain. You should be able to distinguish or tell the difference between brittle and ductile deformation. Okay. And then finally, you should be able to predict how temperature, confining pressure, type of rock, and time all affect that rock deformation. Okay, great. So let's move on with the slides here. Ah, uh, key terms. Yeah, these are big ones. So one of the things that's going to make life easy for you guys is we've found some of the key terms that we'll be talking about today. We don't want you to write them down. You've already got them written in your notes. But at any point, if Miss Awad and I are talking and we use some of these terms, check back to your notes, see what they mean. If you need to pause the video, pause the video and flip back to see what we're talking about. Okay, so terms that we're gonna be using are deformation, stress, differential stress, strain, elastic deformation, ductile deformation, brittle deformation, and joint. Now, I'm noticing that some of the terms that are listed here are terms that students should remember hearing in Chemistry 1, so you might already have a good idea of what some of those terms are and have some ideas about how we're gonna be using them. So listen for them as we go through the segment. Let's go on to the next slide. All right, so first I see we got a couple pictures on the left. Uh, on the far left, we've got a picture of a landscape. And then on the right, it looks like they're comparing the landscape to someone bending a rod or bending a stick or something. So the top position, it's actually the original position, how the land looks at the beginning. And then we're going to start building up some of that strain. So we're starting to move some of the rocks and build up some strain there. Okay? And then for the third picture, it looks like it says slippage. And it looks like we broke the rock. Okay? And it's moved side to side. And then the last one, it says that strain is released. So everything looks nice and calm there. Okay. So the question here that we're trying to answer is when does failure occur? So in this picture, the failure actually occurs between the second and the third picture, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see how that analogy works out. If we're thinking about something common, like a, a piece of wood, a broom handle, or some other a piece ruler, of, yeah. of wood. Yeah, even a ruler would be a great idea. So you've got a piece of wood or a ruler in between your hands, 
and you start to apply force to it, right? You're bending it. You're pushing your hands together, and that's causing strain to build up in that wood, right? Okay, yeah, just like in the landscape, too. Yeah, and at some point, you apply so much pressure to it, so much force to it, that it fails or breaks or deforms brittily, yeah. right? Yeah, and it's going to break. I might not be able to do it, but I know you def definitely yeah, could snap it in half, it. yeah. Now, when it's just bending, what kind of deformation is that? So when we're bending, we haven't broken it yet. We're just bending. That's going to be our ductile deformation. Okay. And once we get that rod to snap, break it in half, you know, I can always dream that I can break that in half, that's going to be our brittle deformation. Okay. You're snapping it in two. And then after it's broken, after the failure, the strain is released. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we have our analogy back and forth between what happens on a large scale in a landscape with stress building up, strain building up, and then when it's released with the actual failure or deformation. So the deformation is a change in shape or size. Mm -hmm. And we can see that this has definitely changed its shape and size. Mm -hmm. Okay, you ready to go on to the next slide? Let's do this. All right. Okay, so now we're looking at the effects of directional stress. Now that directional stress, that one's a goofy word to me. Can you help explain that yeah. a little bit, Ms. Awad? So I think when we talk about directional stress, if you think about stress being applied to something, it might be applied 360 degrees evenly all the way around from every direction. Mm -hmm. When we talk about directional stress, though, it's not being applied evenly from 360 degrees. It's only being applied from two different directions. Okay. So let's look at the types of directional stress and their effects on materials. Okay, well the first one I see, it's compressional stress. And when I think of compression, I think of squishing two things together. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if we look at the definition, it says causes rock units to shorten horizontally and thicken vertically. Okay, so if I squeeze these rocks together, just like in the upper left-hand corner, you can see that I'm going to start to squish them or shorten them horizontally, and they actually get thicker vertically, up and down. Okay. So I think students are actually going to see a really good example of this and be able to do this in lab when we do our favorite. Play-Doh Lab. Yay, Play-Doh Lab. So you could imagine taking some different colors of Play-Doh, making it into sheets, laying it out, piling it up, and then actually applying a compressional stress to it and seeing what happens. And that's really an analogy to what happens over a long period of time when compressional stresses are applied to rocks. Now, there's got to be a type of fault or a type of uh, bo plate boundary that we learned about that has some kind of compression involved with it too, isn't there? That would be convergent plate boundaries. So, what do you think about the amount of time and the amount of force and the amount of heat that you might need to apply to get rocks to deform ductily like this mm. versus Play-Doh? Oh my gosh! Well, I can squeeze and squeeze rocks between my hands, and I just can't get them to deform at all. Okay. And I'm like a really strong guy and I can't make it happen. So it's going to take a lot more time, more force, but we can at least use this as an analogy. Absolutely, yeah. Right. What about tensional stress? So the next one, when I think of tension, I always think of rock climbing. Okay? When I'm hanging off of a rope and I'm holding on my carabiner, there's forces that are keeping the rope tensioned. Okay? It's keeping it taut. And so usually what it is when we think of tension is it's going forces in opposite directions. Okay? So if we look at the picture, the rock units are actually going to lengthen horizontally and they're going to thin vertically. Okay, So the picture, these ones have stretched out further side to side and vertically they're squished a little bit together. So they're being pulled apart in this case. Now isn't that another type of plate boundary we're talking about? Yeah, that would be a divergent plate boundary. Mm, okay. Nice. Okay, last one we got, okay. shear stress. Okay, It causes horizontal displacement along the fault line. Take a look at the picture. We got a nice horizontal line right across the middle of the picture here. And it looks like I have a river that's flowing down. And it looked like this river used to be over shifted right below it. But now it's kind of shifted off to the side. So what actually happened is we had plates or some kind of deformation that moved side to side. Okay? Mm -hmm. That reminds me of another plate boundary. That would be a transform plate boundary and a strike slip fault. Gotcha. Right. Okay. So now one other thing I want to point out here, when we look at these three pictures, we have two different views. The top two pictures are what we're going to call cross-sectional views. Okay. That means you're looking into the side of something. So that's like looking at a profile. You're looking at their side. Okay. This picture is a map view, or think about it as you're flying in an airplane over this landscape and you're looking straight down on this area. I like to think about it like a piece of cake, too. Like if you were looking at the side of a piece of cake, you could see those layers. But if you looked at it from above, you would see all the writing on top. All right, good.
Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, wow. so strike and dip. These are two terms that you guys are going to see later on. Um, it's a really complex issue that we're talking about. We're trying to put three-dimensional thoughts into two dimensions. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, so this is a way that geologists actually use to talk about the orientation of rock layers. Are they flat? Are they tilted? And what is their compass direction? And we'll be talking a little bit about strike and dip when we go on our field trip in a couple weeks. So yeah. students will get more of a, an idea about strike and dip at that point. And it's much easier to see when you're actually with the rock. Yeah. So we'll see it a little bit on the field trip when we get out so there. So let's take a look at the mastery check. All right. So here's what you guys are going to do. <clears throat> we gave you a list of a couple things. And you're going to be able to categorize the following examples as either that ductile or the brittle deformation. Okay. So one of those two uh, deformations we have. And then the last one, you got to explain why. Okay. okay. Really simple. And the types of deformations we're going to see are the type of examples. All right. So we're going to consider three things. <clears throat> Two plates that are colliding, so in maybe a convergent situation, to form a folded mountain range. Is that ductile or brittle deformation and why? A transform fault that's offsetting a mid-ocean ridge segment. And is that brittle or ductile deformation and why? And a crack that might open up in the ground after an earthquake along the San Andreas Fault. Gotcha. And what type of deformation is that and why? Okay. All well, right. Good luck, guys. You guys should do pretty well because you have two awesome teachers in front of you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So have a good night. And we'll see you guys tomorrow. All right. See you in class tomorrow. Be ready to discuss that mastery check. Thanks, Mr. Baldwin. Thanks, Mr. Wad.